It is going to be our goal to visualize the basic picture of the graphs of polynomials. Now, we're going to try to graph these things without the use of technology whatsoever. Now, our pictures are not going to be absolutely perfect, but that's actually a good thing. Because sometimes when you draw things to scale, it can actually hide the behavior because the extremes on the top and bottom of the range can be so large that it can be very difficult to see it perfectly. So we want to graph polynomials in such a way that we understand the basic shape of the graph and not just the shape, but also why does the shape look the way it does as opposed to some other picture. When graphing polynomials, you should remember that the graph of a polynomial is always going to be continuous, which remember what this means here. A continuous graph will have no, gra uh, have no uh, gaps in it, no holes, no rips, no asymptotes. It's continuous. You could draw your picture with one continuous stroke of your pen assuming you knew what you were trying to draw at the time. So graphs of polynomials are always continuous. Another thing that's true about polynomial graphs is that they are smooth. And I don't mean like Michael Jackson smooth criminal or anything like that. What I mean is there's no sharp corners uh, or cusp of any kind, things like that. No, no sharp things. Ouch. If you touch the polynomial, you aren't going to poke your finger. You're petting a little bunny. You're not petting a porcupine. So as you draw your polynomials, make sure that the turns are rounded not sharp zigzaggy things. That's not acceptable when graphing a polynomial. So to further understand the graph, we're going to be employing, employing the ideas of end behavior, turning points, and behavior near x-intercepts to graph these things. Uh, also, we'll use information with the y-intercept. So consider the function f of x equals x plus 2 times x minus 1 times x minus 3. So what we can see here is that if you were to multiply this thing out, some stuff you would see is the following. If we multiplied out, the leading term would be x times x times x, which is x cubed. There's going to be a bunch of other things. But then if we look at the constant term, because we got the leading terms by taking together all of the biggest powers of x, x times x times x. If we take the product of all the constant terms, 2 times negative 1 times negative 3, we see that the constant term is going to be a 6. And although there's other terms inside of the polynomial, we care about the leading term and we care about the constant term here. Because what this tells us is the following. The leading term, uh, x cubed here, gives us the end behavior. This is x cubed here, so it'll point up on the right-hand side. It'll point down on the left-hand side. So we see by the end behavior, as x goes to infinity, y goes to infinity. And as x goes to negative infinity, y goes to negative infinity as well. So that's information that we're, we need here. We also learn from the we also learn from the constant term that the y-intercept is going to be six. So we're going to get some point that's above the y above the x-axis here. Now you'll notice that I've drawn no scale on the x-axis or on the y-axis, and that's because my goal in graphing these polynomials is not to come up with a picture that's perfectly drawn to scale. I want to get the intuitive idea of what this shape is going to look like. Because after all, we're unable to, we can't find a perfect picture at this moment uh, because there's some information about the turning points that we won't be able to determine. We'll come back to those in a second. So we know the y-intercept would be 6, which is a positive number. We know the end behavior. What can we say about the x-intercepts? The x-intercept, by the factorization above, is going to be negative 2, 1, and 3. Notice you always grab the opposite sign. Since you see a plus 2, negative 2 is the root. Because you see a negative 1 right here, positive 1 is the x-intercept. And same thing for the negative 3 right here gives us a positive x-intercept. Each of these things shows up once, and so their multiplicities are 1. Each of these have odd multiplicity, and odd for us means that we're going to cross the x-axis. So what I would do is I'm then going to plot some points. So negative 2 would be somewhere over here. We're going to have a 1, and we're going to have a 3 as our x-intercepts. And we can we certainly is a good idea to label these things. 1, 3, negative 2, negative 6 is our coordinates there. And so we know that we're going to be crossing at these x-intercepts. So I'm going to use this to my advantage here. So I'm, going to, I'm exaggerating my end behavior right now. So what I want to do is basically the following. I like to start at the y-intercept. So because you're at the y-intercept, I know that I have to at some point come down to the x-intercept as I move to the left. That's got to happen. Now, how do I do that? I could be like really wiggly, right? But polynomials don't wiggle that much, right? The, the turning numbers are going to be minimal. Because our leading term, 
is a is a cubic. This is a degree three polynomial. That means at most I have two. You have uh, you have less than or equal to two terms on this graph here. So as we graph this thing, we're going to keep the turns minimal. So we're going to have to have one turn as we go from positive y-intercept down to the x-intercept. And because we have odd multiplicity, we're going to cross and go to the other side. And so continuing this thing on, we're going to go and match up with our end behavior that's on the bottom left of the screen there. Likewise, at the, at the uh, y-intercept, I have to also continue down towards the x-intercept at 1. And I'm going to cross to the other side of the x-axis. As I get closer to x equals 3, I'm going to again have to cross the x-axis and come upward towards my end behavior, which remember my end behavior should be pointing up on the right, the upper right hand side. And so this then gives me the picture of my polynomial. It's gonna have this shape where it goes up and then down and then up again. This is the basic shape passing through the intercepts, x equals negative two, y equals negative six, x equals one and x equals three. And so let's compare this with, I might have to zoom out one more time. Let's compare this with a computer-generated image. Oh, well, I thought I could get them all on the same screen. That's not going to happen here. So let's look at this one is actually one drawn by a computer comparison. And I'd say we did pretty good, right? Now, some things I should mention here is that our picture is not necessarily perfect, right? Because some things we don't know. We don't actually know where the turning points are going to be. I mean, we can see them on the computer image. It seems like there's some turning point close to 2 and one close to negative 1, but I can't exactly guarantee that at this venture right here. Turns out that we have enough information from the factorization of the polynomial to find the x and y intercepts with their multiplicities and end behavior, but we don't have enough information to find the turning points. In order to do that, we have to actually use calculus. We use something called the derivative which is a topic we are not going to do in college algebra because, again, that takes us beyond the scope of this class. Our picture is not meant to be perfect, just an intuition of what the graph is going to be doing. And you can see that even without the graphing calculator, that we are able to get a pretty good, accurate picture of the basic shape of this graph. All right, uh, let's do another example. This time, let's consider the function g of x equals x plus or 2x plus 1 e times x minus 3 squared. So notice here that if we were to multiply this thing out, we would take a 2x and we would times that by x squared. So the leading term is going to look like 2 times x cubed. You have to put all of the powers of x together. So I have a 1x, I have a 2x here. So you get an x3, x cubed when you're done. And then keep track of the coefficient 2 as well. So the leading term is going to be 2x cubed. If we focus on the constant term, you're going to get a 1 times a negative 3 squared. So that ends up being a positive 9. 1 times negative 3 times negative 3. This gives us some important information about the function in terms of end behavior. Our behavior is going to look like an odd monomial function with positive coefficients. So just like we saw a moment ago, x is going to go as x goes to infinity, y will go to infinity. So we point up on the top right. And as x goes to negative infinity, y will likewise go to negative infinity. So the graph is going to point down on the, on the bottom left. Our x-intercept again is, po our y-intercept, excuse me, is going to be positive this time. So again, we're going to get something above the x-axis there. Now let's look at the roots of the polynomial. Because we have an x plus 1, or 2x plus 1, that tells us the x-intercepts, the first one's going to be negative 1 half. Because really all we're doing is we're just solving the equation 2x plus 1 equals 0. That means 2x equals negative 1 and x equals negative 1 half. This is why you switch the sign. Because when you move it to the other side of the equation, it'll switch its signs. So we get x is negative 1 half. That's our first x-intercept. And the other x-intercept will be positive 3. In terms of multiplicity, we see that 2x plus 1, it shows up as a factor once. So negative 1 half will have a multiplicity of 1. x minus 3 shows up twice. So its multiplicity will be 2. The first one has an odd multiplicity, which odd means it's going to cross the x-axis. But x equals 3, that's an even multiplicity. And this tells us that our function is going to touch the x-axis but not cross it. In particular, what we see is the following, that as x, as x approaches negative 1 half, our function will look like, let me scroll this up a little bit, our function will look like, f of x will be approximately, we're going to plug in negative 1 half into the 3 spot. 
That is, we're going to plug a negative one half in this sector right here and leave the other one alone. So we have a 2x plus 1, and we times that by, we're going to get a negative one half minus 3 squared. Now be aware here that if I take a negative minus a negative, that's going to be a negative. I don't actually care what it is. And when then you square it, you're going to get a positive. Uh, and so this thing will look approximately like some positive number a times 2x plus 1. It's going to look like a line. So when we come over to the picture of x equals negative 1 half, it's going to look like a positive increasing line. So you get something like that. We can see that already. And I'm actually going to use a different color to illustrate what's going on here. We expect it to go up like that. And that agrees with the in behavior. We kind of expect it to be connected in a picture like that. Um, the next thing to mention is that as x approaches 3, we see that our function will look like it'll be approximately plug in 3 for the x, except for where it says x minus 3. You're going to get 2 times 3 plus 1 times x minus 3 squared. Uh, again, that's going to be a 7, but all I really care about is that it's a positive number. Uh, the exact value doesn't matter. You're going to get a positive 7, x minus 3 squared. What this tells us is that when we come over to x equals 2, our function will look like an upward concave parabola, something like this. Now, personally, when it comes to the x-intercepts and the behavior near the x-intercepts, I generally don't plug the values into the function to get these exact coefficients because the information I have already gives me that. When I combine information about touching and crossing, right, because this is going to be a cross and this is going to be a touch, if you combine that with the y-intercepts location and the in behavior we already know, that information is redundant. Now, don't get me wrong, redundant information is wonderful in this situation, but we don't exactly need it. We have enough information as it is. So what we're going to do is the following. So we have an x-intercept at negative 1 half. We have an x-intercept at 2. And we have a y-intercept here at 9. And so starting at the y-intercept, if we go downwards, we're going to cross a negative 1 half because that's an odd multiplicity. And also because our in behavior wants us to go down over here. So if we draw our picture, uh, we're going to kind of come down, 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 down. We get something like that. On the right-hand side, we know that as we come towards x equals 2, we're going to have to kind of just bounce off the x-axis because we touch the x-axis, we don't cross it. Then we have to come upward to match the end behavior we have. And so this then gives us a picture of the graph. We have a crossing at x equals negative 1 half. We have a touching at x equals 2. We only have two turns on the graph because this is a cubic function, so it can have at most two turns. And two are going to have to be necessary. On the upper right, it goes up. Uh, that is on the right side, it goes up. On the left side, it goes down. This matches the information about turning points, intercepts, and in behavior. This is giving us a pretty good picture of this function. Let's scroll down to see a computer-generated image. Here we go. Uh, again, it looks pretty close to what we drew earlier. The exact location of the extrema, we don't exactly know. Now, the fact that x equals... Three, x equals uh, 3 was, uh, since it touches the x-axis and doesn't cross, that does have to be extremum. It, it's going to be a local minimum in this situation. So that one we do know. But the location of the local maximum, we have no idea where it is. It could be, you know, we might guess 1, but, you know, 1 might be somewhere right here. It actually looks like it might be a little bit less than 1. Also, what about the point of inflection? Where is that? At this venture, we're not worried about the point of inflection. Uh, because, again, the, the inflection points... And the turning points, the extremum, the extrema here, we know that they exist. We know roughly where they're going to be. But if we want to find the precise location of those points, we're going to have to use derivatives from calculus. So that's a topic we would have to do in the sequel to this class. Uh, at SUU, this is Math 1210, Calculus 1. But for this, even without any calculus, just our pre-calculus tools, we have enough information using endpoints, x-intercepts, y-intercepts, and turning points to actually get a very good picture of what our function looks like. And that'll be good enough for our purposes here in pre-calculus.